Welcome to this, the 11th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2014. Could I ask everyone to please make sure that mobile phones and electronic devices are switched off? Uh, we only have one item of business today, and it's not normal for us to meet on a Thursday morning, but we're doing it because we have this one evidence session on welfare reform. And I would like to welcome to our committee this morning uh, David Mundell, MP, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Scotland and the UK Government, and Ian Walsh, Head of Working Age ben Benefits at the DWP. I understand that the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Scotland would like to make a brief introductory statement. So I'll hand over to you, Minister, and welcome to the committee. I know you're not a stranger uh, to this building or these rooms, so uh, you're more than welcome back, and I look forward to having a, a discussion with you this morning. Thank you, Convener. I'm, I'm pleased a, uh, to be here and, and have the opportunity to give evidence because it fits in uh, well, I think, with a, a number of activities which I've been undertaking over the past few weeks and months. Obviously, I've previously met informally a, uh, with, a, with the committee. Uh, Someone's phone's going off because I can hear it myself. It's, it's causing interference. So. I don't think it's I don't know, there's, there's someone's phone is interfering, but uh, okay. Sorry about that. No, it, it's no problem. It, it, it's consistent with uh, a series of uh, activities I've undertaken recently, uh, such as meeting with all uh, of Scotland's local authorities uh, twice in, in, in recent months to uh, particularly uh, dis discuss discretionary housing payment and the spare room uh, subsidy. Obviously, I've had informal. Um, discussions uh, with this uh, committee and we've met with the COSLA, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and other uh, stakeholders. I, I think uh, the discussion today is quite timely because uh, yesterday the Deputy First Minister and I uh, signed off a letter to go to uh, all local authorities in Scotland uh, confirming that they could move forward with making uh, discretionary housing payments beyond a, uh, the allocated current a, uh, limit and a, a, a so-called letter a, of comfort. Uh, and I'm sure you'll have uh, questions about that and a, uh, that a process. So i uh, very happy to, to, to discuss that and any other issues you want to raise. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, yeah, I would like to, to start by asking about the, the Section uh, 63 order. Uh, obviously, this committee has been very keen to have that in front of Parliament as quickly as possible so that we can get everything on a statutory footing. Um, you have given this letter of comfort to local authorities, but can you give us some idea of the official timescale for the, the regulations to be in place? We've worked a, uh, very well together. And I, I, I think that the um, transfers, transfer of powers uh, in relation to uh, the setting of the discretionary housing uh, payment uh, limit is actually a demonstration that the Scottish Government and UK Government can actually work uh, together. I mean, obviously, uh, and we can't hide the fact that welfare issues are a very political issue. It's a very politicised period uh, in Scotland, and it hasn't always been straightforward to have a, uh, the dialogue that, that might have been uh, appropriate on some of these uh, issues. But in once a, um, the decision uh, had been uh, made, in the sense that I made the offer to the Scottish Government uh, to uh, transfer the powers to set the discretionary housing payment uh, limit, and the Deputy First Minister accepted that, very shortly thereafter we met, uh, and we've been in regular communication uh, since then. We've tasked, both tasked our officials to meet uh, as a demanding uh, parliamentary timescale which would see the order go to the November meeting uh, of the Privy Council. It's quite complicated in the current uh, environment because obviously the Scottish Parliament has, has a different sitting uh, arrangement uh, this year. Uh, we have a, um, a, 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 a cycle which means the House of Lords, for example, isn't sitting in September, although the Commons is. But officials have worked to cut down all the uh, uh, timescales to a minimum to ensure that, that we can get that uh, uh, order to the Privy Council in November. I'm confident uh, that we can, but the Deputy First Minister and I agreed yesterday we'd speak again uh, in August uh, while this Parliament's sitting just to ensure that we were on track. Thanks very much for that, uh, Minister. That's, that's very helpful to, to know that, that there's such a positive 
uh, attitude to getting this uh, issue resolved. But the reality is this committee has taken evidence now for the, the best part of two years on all of the aspects of the Welfare Reform Act. We've uh, concluded reports on the, the bedroom tax or the under-occupancy charge, as you would prefer it, sanctions, the work capability assessment. We've commissioned our own research, which shows that £1.6 billion is going to be taken out of the Scottish economy. Now, that's a, a round figure in, in uh, Scotland-wide terms, but that's impacting at a local level to the tune of £800 per adult in some local communities. Those are horrendous figures for people who are already on the breadline to lose. Now, whatever the motivation or the ideology which is driving the Welfare Reform Act, will you concede that there are problems, that this Act is not achieving the outcomes that you're looking for? That's the conclusions that our uh, reports have arrived at. Do you concede that there are problems uh, with this Act? I'm, I'm obviously not going to uh, uh, make that concession. And, and from the start, I'm thinking in my initial remarks, and indeed my dealings with local authorities across Scotland uh, and others, I accept that there are, there are political differences on the issue uh, of welfare re reform and that we're not necessarily going to uh, agree o o on certain aspects uh, of policy. Those policies have been debated at length, uh, as you know, in the Westminster Parliament, they've been debated uh, in, in this Parliament, and, and your committee has engaged uh, in the activity uh, that, you, that, that, you've set, that you, you, you've set out. Now, in relation to a number of issues, th th there, are, there are specific uh, issues, and I think we demonstrated, a, uh, for example, that we've, uh, that we've listened a, on, on issues that have been raised uh, by uh, this committee when I, uh, in some of the informal discussions, for example, the issue of, of digital uh, access to uh, benefit claims was raised. Uh, the government then uh, took the view that the, there would not be a requirement for everybody to digitally uh, access uh, the system. Those people who didn't have access to broadband didn't have uh, the services. We had uh, the issue raised of direct payments to the most vulnerable uh, uh, people in a uh, society uh, and, and concerns about if those payments were made, people would not then pay, on, pay their landlords and we would a, uh, be uh, having uh, run into difficulties for landlords and difficulties for tenants. We then announced uh, that the most vulnerable will not be uh, part of the direct uh, payments system, the sort of people uh, who do have drug and alcohol issues, for example. We looked at the issue of rurality, which was raised specifically with this committee by a number of housing associations and, and the local authorities, and we brought forward measures a, uh, in, in, under the, the, the direct housing payments system to deal a, uh, with that issue, accepting that in large rural areas people couldn't move a, as easily as, as in other areas, and we put in place a funding mechanism. We put in place a bid funding mechanism uh, for additional DHP, which a number of councils applied to. I, I mean, I, I think those were the, you know, those were positive. Uh, responses to issues uh, that uh, were raised. And I, I, I'm not disputing a, uh, that there are legitimate issues to be raised and that it is appropriate to have a dialogue uh, uh, about them. But, you know, we're not going to agree on, on, on the fundamental uh, uh, policy positions. When this committee was established, I asked everyone for their perspectives on welfare reform, and it was a unanimous uh, view in this committee that welfare badly needed to be reformed, but there was also a view that it didn't need to be reformed badly. We have seen tens of thousands of people being forced to go to food banks, tens of thousands of children dependent on handouts to be fed. That's a direct result, according to the evidence that we've received and the reports that we've concluded, that this is a result of your welfare changes. Will you concede that there is a direct link between your Reform Act and the increase in the usage of food banks? As I understand it, your report on the food bank issue wasn't, uh, wasn't a, a unanimous a, uh, 
uh, report, and uh, all members of the committee didn't uh, agree uh, uh, that conclusion. I, I, I don't accept uh, um, the, the assertions uh, that are made. I think the use of food banks is a complicated uh, issue, and we do need to have uh, more uh, research to understand a, uh, what is underpinning a, uh, that use. But I, I don't subscribe a, to, to a simplistic uh, view that it is entirely due a, to, to a welfare reforms. I just correct you, Mr. I didn't say it was entirely due. I said there was a link between the increase and the Welfare Reform Act. I didn't say it was entirely down to the, the, the Act. But there, there is a direct link um, between the increase and the Act, and that's been proven in evidence that we've received from academics and those involved in, in delivery of these services. I've no, well, I know, I know the evidence that, that, that you've received, but I think, it's, I, I think it, it's, it's a much more complicated issue. I think we do need to, uh, we need to fully uh, understand a, uh, why a, it's the case. I mean, some of the uh, increase in, in relation to the a, um, use of food banks may be down to the more reporting a, uh, of, of that use. A, some is obviously down to the greater uh, availability and visibility uh, of food banks, and I think you would welcome the fact that one of the things this government has done is to ensure that the availability of food banks is advertised in uh, job centres uh, and elsewhere. But as your report itself concludes, there is a, an increase in the use of, of food banks in other uh, affluent uh, Western uh, countries. There was an in, a tenfold uh, increase in the use of uh, food banks under the previous government at a time uh, which people would, would associate with relative uh, economic uh, growth. So I think there are some uh, complicated uh, issues uh, there. There isn't, you know, there isn't any uh, doubt that there are some people uh, who have gone uh, uh, to food banks because they've been the subject, for example, uh, uh, of uh, sanctions or uh, a delay in receiving uh, benefits. Although uh, on the latter, I think, uh, you know, there is some good news uh, because the turnaround in the payment of benefits uh, has uh, increased quite uh, significantly to about 92% of benefits being paid within. A, uh, the time scale that we would aspire to. I'll open it up to other members of the committee and I'll go to Linda to be followed by Jamie. Uh, thank you, convener. I've got, just got two questions. I'm aware of the time constraints. Um, Minister, you, you will be aware that, that we have had great difficulty in this con committee convincing the appropriate uh, Westminster ministers and cabinet <coughs> secretaries to come and speak to us. And whilst it's always nice to see you here and, and very glad to welcome you, we were expecting the Secretary of State now, I completely understand the important business that he's attending to uh, this morning in London, um, but it's so important that I wouldn't have thought it was just arranged yesterday and that therefore we have said, had such short notice that he wasn't able to come along. Can you tell me, was it another case of a Cabinet Secretary not wishing to come along to this committee? The Secretary of State is uh, engaged in... Uh, activities around uh, the commemoration of the First World War and Armed Forces Day, which is taking place uh, in Stirling on, a, uh, on Saturday. And a, um, unfortunately, those a, uh, requirements have, have conflicted with this uh, committee. But I've, as, as you know, I've been heavily involved uh, directly with this issue and directly in the engagement with the uh, Scottish uh, Government. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here to uh, answer your concerns. As I said, it's very nice to have you here, but I, I would still contend that uh, less than a day's notice is not really acceptable respect for either our convener um, or our committee. Um, leading on from what you've just, just said, Minister, I'm glad you've been very much involved because I am aware, um, I think I'm right in saying that Secretary of State is not a member of the, the Cabinet Subcommittee for Social Justice, so can I ask you um, how often uh, does he meet with the members um, of that subcommittee? When was the last time that he did meet with them? And could I, could I ask you directly uh, what reforms the Secretary of State for Scotland and, and yourself, of course, um, have had influence over in development? 
I think the most a uh, significant a uh, proposal is the offer that I made to the uh, Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, uh, to take on the responsibility for uh, setting the cap for discretionary uh, housing payment. That, that is a significant uh, development uh, within a, the devolved settlement. Uh, and I think that that is one that shows that we can work together within a, the devolved settlement to meet the specific uh, needs and requirements uh, of a, um, Scotland. Of course, I would contend, and I have previously uh, done so, that there were significant powers within the Scotland Act uh, that the Scottish Government could have deployed in relation to a, um, alleviating a, um, issues that, that, it, that it believed had arisen, a, uh, but it chose not to do so. A, uh, I believe that taking forward a, the devolution of the, the cap on, di on discretionary uh, housing payments meant that the issues that local authorities uh, raised would have been resolved a, uh, rather than uh, them having to uh, sit out uh, an ongoing a, uh, discussion between uh, the two governments and I think that was the right thing to do, the right way to proceed and actually the way that we're implementing it currently shows that we can uh, work together. The Secretary of State and I were very uh, heavily uh, uh, involved in ensuring that there was a recognition of uh, rurality in terms of, of uh, the discretionary uh, housing payment and I specifically took back from issues uh, raised uh, at, uh, by, by this committee, I think Mr Stewart in fact, uh, in relation to the, to the, to the digital uh, issue which, is, which affects the whole uh, range of, of, of welfare uh, policies to make clear that people would not be required uh, uh, in relation to that access. So the issues that have been fed back to me from stakeholders in Scotland, we have a, a taken forward to influence a policy. Can I suggest to you that these are consequences of the development of policy? What I'm really interested in is at what level of engagement um, the Scotland Office has had with the policy development of welfare reform in that they have a responsibility um, to some degree to protect the people in Scotland from consequences of any welfare reform that is set at Westminster. We've been closely involved. I am, I am in regular uh, contact and meet regularly with both Ian Duncan Smith and uh, with uh, uh, Lord Freud. Uh, I've accompanied Lord Freud to a number of, of, of events that we've held with, with stakeholders here uh, in Scotland to get a, a distinct Scottish perspective. And of course, as, as you're aware, the Scottish Affairs Select Committee uh, at Westminster has, you know, has had a very significant uh, involvement uh, in this issue, although uh, your, your colleague, Dr Whiteford, chooses not uh, to attend uh, those meetings. Uh, perhaps, convener, um, the minister yeah, could accompany so Lord Freud uh, along to this committee at some time in the future. Thank you. Uh, the invitation is still extended to them all. Um, Jamie. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, Neil Cooling, uh, a senior uh, DWP official, uh, told this committee uh, that uh, job centres often receive thank you cards from sanctioned claimants. I'm just wondering, Minister, how many thank you cards you've received from sanctioned claimants as a minister in a government responsible for this policy? Are you aware of any of your constituents sending job centres thank you cards? What, what I, I would uh, say uh, in relation to sanctions and, in, uh, and individuals who have been sanctioned, and this is an offer which I have made to all 32 local authorities in Scotland, I make, made to all MPs in Scotland, and I certainly make to all members of this committee and the Scottish Parliament. If you are aware of individuals who you think have been unfairly sanctioned, then bring them to our attention. Bring, them to, bring the details of the, of the claims to our attention and we will, we will look at those, um, uh, look at those uh, sanctions and, and, and whether they have been... Well, well the, the interesting thing, convener, and I'm, I'm not flippant about this issue, but having made that offer 
you know, we haven't previously to, to, to all local authorities, we, we haven't been overwhelmed with claims. I think there is a degree of mythology out there because we haven't, and you may have, we haven't found the person who's been sanctioned because they were at a job interview or because the lift broke down. What we want to ensure is that we have a sanction system that is fair and is reasonable. Now, I don't know, I, and I may not be totally on top, I apologise for this, I may not be totally on top of SNP uh, policy, but I, I don't think that any of the, the parties present is arguing that there shouldn't be some form uh, of, of sanction uh, regime in relation to uh, welfare uh, payments. What we've got to make sure is it's fair, it's reasonable and it's proportionate. And that's, that's what we're trying a, uh, to achieve. We've instigated a, uh, the Oakley review, and I'm sure as part of your deliberations you'll be very interested to, you know, to see what the outcome, how we can improve uh, communications, because I accept uh, that there are some people who've signed up to certain commitments that they haven't fully themselves understood what they've, what they've signed up to or what a, um, the implications of, of, of sanctions uh, might be. So we've got to improve communications, we've got to have a greater degree of consistency and we've got to have the ability to uh, review a, uh, quite a, uh, a quickly. But you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not aware that anyone is suggesting a, uh, that you can have an effective uh, regime without there being some form of sanction. Well, Convener, you may be right, the Minister's postbag may be busy, but it doesn't sound like an answer. It's been busy with thank you cards uh, by omission of a, an affirmative to the uh, question. And the Minister's quite correct. Indeed, this committee has published a report in which we accept the need for conditionality in a welfare system, but the point we have made is that the specific sanctions regime that has been put in place is not proportionate, is not fair. And one of the things that we have found is that there is a direct link between that element of the welfare system and the rest of the welfare reforms that the government put in place, and the increased use of, of food banks. I know that's an area that the convenes explored with you, but I want to explore it as well. Oxfam Scotland told us there is a link between welfare reform and the surge in the use of food banks. Are they wrong? I think, as I've said in my previous answer, the use of food banks is a complicated uh, issue. 17% of people uh, from the Trussell Trust's figures um, say that they've attended uh, food banks uh, partly due a, um, to, a, to sanctions. So clearly uh, there are people who've been subject to sanctions who uh, are attending uh, food banks. All, this, the DWP also have a, you know, a, a hardship fund which, which supports people a, um, uh, that are subject uh, to sanctions. But if, uh, you know, I, I mean, we, we have to go back to the principal point. Do we accept that there is some form of sanctions regime or not? So, as Vice Scotland told us, the national evidence and our on the ground co face evidence point towards welfare reform as a cause of the increase in demand for food banks. Are they wrong? Well, I think if. You know, we're going to come back to the fundamental point, and I'm going to, you're going to maybe ask the same question, and I'm going to give you the same answer, that I believe the use of food banks is a complicated issue in, into which there are many factors into which we need more research and into which it cannot be simplistically said that it is, that it is entirely a, uh, due uh, to, to, wel to, to welfare uh, reform. And I'm, I, you know, I, I'm simply not going to... A, uh, simply not going to a, accept that. I hope that's a commitment that the UK government will instigate some research. I hope you'll be speaking to Oxfam Scotland, Citizens by Scotland and SCVO who said welfare reforms and cuts have definitely contributed to the rise in the number of food banks. Are they wrong? Well, SCVO, I certainly have said a number of things uh, in recent uh, months with which I don't uh, uh, agree. But uh, what I do, uh, I, I do agree with the point that you make is that we do need to have uh, more research and understanding as to what's uh, going on in relation uh, to food banks. As I, I said in uh, earlier comments, you know, there are a number of, of wealthy, developed countries uh, wh which are also seeing a... Uh, uh, the, the, the use uh, of, of food banks, and we, 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 we need to understand a, uh, why, that, why that is. I hope in your, the Research Commission you'll take on board uh, our uh, considerable report on food banks. One final question, if I may, uh, Convener. The Secretary of State 
said of the welfare system with BBC Good Morning Scotland 24th of April, this is a fantastic system. We know that over 22,000 children used Trussell Trust food banks alone in 2013-14. I know you contend that's not all down to welfare reform, but Oxfam Scotland said in Vice Scotland, the SCVO, the BMA, who I didn't cite, contend otherwise. People in Carlton and Glasgow will be £880 worse off as a result of benefit cuts. It will be £460 per working age adult in Scotland. Sheffield Hallam University have told us that it would have actually been higher if this Parliament and the Scottish Government hadn't uh, mitigated some of the effects of welfare reform. And Save the Children estimate that one in three children in Scotland could be living in poverty by 2020 due to welfare cuts. Does this speak of a fantastic system to you? Well, I don't accept a, a, a number a, of those a, uh, figures, and, and a, uh, I can come back to you in detail as to, uh, as to why uh, not. I do think it is important to place a, uh, the Sheffield Hallam a report uh, in context, and obviously the most recent one is uh, relatively new, and, and I, I would be again quite happy to provide a detailed response to it. But it seems to me that the one a, a premise in it which is uh, lacking is that it doesn't take into account uh, the fact that people might actually move into work. It, 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 it proceeds on a very pessimistic uh, outlook that everybody currently uh, on benefit uh, would remain uh, on uh, benefit. That's clearly a, uh, not a, uh, the case. A, um, unemployment in Scotland, which I'm sure the committee uh, welcomes, is 48,000 lower than it was uh, in 2012. We've got a record number uh, of women in work, and the number of GSA claimants has decreased. So I, I think that you know the, the, the context of the, of the Sheffield Hallam uh, report uh, on an initial uh, look uh, doesn't actually factor in the in, in that people might. Uh, and, and would be moving into work because ultimately my position, the UK government position, is that work is, is, is the way uh, out of poverty for all but those most vulnerable who are, who are not in a position to work. I think we'd all accept that, but Professor Fothergill dealt with that point and it wasn't so much that his report was pessimistic, it was rather his opinion based on his expertise that the UK government is rather optimistic and it's a look that the welfare reforms will in of themselves bring people into work. But I'll I'll leave it there, convener. Alex, to be followed by Kevin. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, perhaps the reason for some of the problems that we're experiencing uh, and discussing here uh, is that we are involved in a transition at the moment to the flagship uh, universal credit. And a delegation from the committee were able to visit the DWP in Glasgow and talk to them about the experience so far uh, of implementing uh, universal credit. And not only the, the senior people who were involved in the process, but also some of the, those who were working on the front line and actually dealing directly with people. Uh, however, the, in spite of the fact that the message we got was very positive, uh, there is, it would appear, a serious uh, issue around timescale for implementation, uh, and we've seen targets for the implementation of universal credit move back successively. Is it possible for the Minister to give us uh, some indication of what the current expectation is in timescale for introduction, and whether we're likely to see any further delays? I think it, it's obvious that it's, it's just very important that, that a major change uh, like the introduction of universal credit is, is right as it, as it a, uh, proceeds. It, it is such a significant a, uh, change. And therefore, the, the approach has, been, ha, has changed in terms of, of the a, incremental uh, na the, the incremental nature and timetable uh, that was originally uh, set out. But the, the, the aspiration remains a, uh, to move towards a, a full implementation 2016-2017, but not to set individual staging posts a, uh, along, uh, along the way a, uh, for exactly you know, the reason uh, that, that you mentioned. I mean, if you if you have if if you're driven by a timetable, you're not necessarily driven by uh, getting it. You've got to be driven by getting it right, rather than meeting uh, time scales that you've set for yourself. Mm -hmm. We've heard when we visited Glasgow that uh, 
areas such as, for example, the number of people who were being put back onto housing benefit being paid directly uh, to landlords uh, was smaller as a proportion than initial expectations. Uh, we also heard that the number who were able to engage online was higher than initial expectations. Is there a prospect uh, as we go through the pilots and the initial introductions that we may actually see the, the operation come back onto schedule and perhaps be speeded up? I, I think I, I would stick to the, the, you know, the time scale uh, that, that we've set out, uh, I set out initially. I think clearly what the pilots are about uh, you know, are about learning uh, uh, as we uh, as we go, understanding uh, specific uh, issues. I, I think it's well recognised that Universal Credit has worked uh, in, in the initial pilots pretty well with with relatively straightforward uh, claimants. It's as you move forward to uh, people who have a mo you know a, a number of uh, benefits and a, uh, a that, that that you have to you have to build. A, uh, that uh, forward, so I wouldn't want to set unrealistic, a uh, you know, unrealistic a uh, time scale or, or thought that it could be brought a uh, forward. What I what I can say is, I mean, I remain convinced that universal credit is is the right a uh, way forward, and when it's fully uh, introduced, uh, three hundred thousand people in Scotland will actually uh, have uh, be in receipt of additional. A benefit. They won't be, a, uh, as is sometimes characterised, subject to a benefit cuts. 300,000 people in Scotland will have uh, additional benefit and will be in the position to move so much more easily and seamlessly between work uh, or, or part-time work uh, and, and a, uh, the benefit system. I certainly agree with the Minister's position on that, and that's one of the reasons why I'm very keen to see universal credit uh, fully implemented at the earliest possible opportunity. Uh, leaving universal credit and looking at other uh, benefits that will be introduced, the personal independence payment, uh, we've uh, received evidence that those who are on the waiting to be assessed uh, for personal independent payments are having a particularly long wait. Uh, is there any explanation? Well, th th I should qualify that a bit more. We've had uh, SALAS, the organisation which is tasked with uh, doing assessments for PIP on behalf uh, of ATOS, uh, before us on a, a couple of occasions. Uh, I think they don't do the whole of Scotland, but they do a significant part of Scotland. Uh, and they are finding that they could perhaps do more than they're being asked to. Is there a way that the assessment process for PIP could be um, accelerated? I might uh, ask Ian in a moment just to, to, to comment on, on that particular um, a suggestion. The um, th there was a question in, in, in the House of Lords yesterday by Lord McAvoy to um, Lord Freud on, on, on uh, personal independence payments. And the committee may want to just have a look at what was said in, in those exchanges. But the delays are unacceptable. I don't, I'm not going to in any way suggest uh, that, that they aren't. That they are unacceptable. We've got to, we've, we've got to do uh, better. This is a, this is a major uh, change. Uh, the previous uh, government contemplated a change in the disability uh, living allowance, but it was very difficult to take uh, forward, and, 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 and they, didn't do, they didn't do it. So the, the, it's a significant, it is a significant change. A, uh, as I understand it, and Ian may be able to say more, the issue is around the contractors having delivered, according to the contract, the requisite number of a... Uh, uh, medical and qualified personnel uh, uh, to carry out uh, uh, the assessments. But uh, just because it's proved difficult doesn't mean I, I don't think that we should press ahead with doing what is, uh, what is the, the, the right thing. Because in relation particularly to disability living allowance, as you'll be uh, aware, people perhaps had one assessment and then were effectively uh, left on that uh, benefit for long periods uh, a long period of time, in fact, even if they were ever uh, reassessed. So I, uh, I, I think the move to personal independence payments is the right thing to do, but it is a, significant, a very significant change and challenge, and we've got to do better. Ian? 
Yeah, I mean, just to say a couple of things. I mean, just on, on, on the reasons why there's been some delays, I mean, the main one I think the Minister's mentioned about the fact of having enough um, uh, assessors in place and fully qualified, because obviously they've got to be uh, trained up to do it. There's also been um, some of the assessments have perhaps taken slightly uh, longer than was uh, assumed. Obviously, they've got to take as long as they take, but on the whole, they've taken slightly longer. And also, more of the cases have been done uh, in person as opposed to on the papers. So there's been a variety of reasons why essentially the output has been a bit less than uh, expected. Um, I mean, in terms of getting uh, you know, additional work through, I mean, the, you know, the government's priority at the moment is to make sure that the length of time it's taken for people who are waiting is, is reduced. And so they've kind of like, um, we've dialled back some of the natural uh, reassessment cases to focus on the new claims to get the processing times down. Now, as soon as either you know, Atos or, or Capita, the two people we contract with, you know, we're confident that A, they're on top of um, uh, the, the caseload that they have and can take on more. Um, of course, we'll want them um, to do so, but we just, you know, we want to be very careful about making sure that we don't turn the tap on a bit more until they are dealing with the current cases as, as quickly as we would want to. Just, just to finish my comments, I think the situation we discovered was that the subcontractor who was responsible for doing these assessments across most of Scotland, or most of central Scotland, I believe, uh, seemed to have or seemed to believe that they have capacity that's currently being unused. Uh, on the basis that uh, they are offering appointments and they're not being filled, or they're not being filled in a, a timely way. We'll, yeah, we'll, we most certainly will uh, take that back. I mean, as a committee, be aware. I mean, obviously, the, the payment is backdated uh, uh, to uh, the point of application, and also people who are on disability living allowance continue to receive it during uh, uh, during the process. But you know, I'm not going to you know I'm not going to pretend the situation is acceptable. It's not, and we must uh, do better. Thanks, Kevin. To be followed by Annabel. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, my colleague Jamie Hepburn pointed out that 22,387 children used Trussell Trust food banks in 2013-14, which is an increase of 1,103% uh, from the previous year. Can I ask the Minister um, if the UK Government has made any estimate of the impact of the introduction of spending cap? on child poverty. By, can you clarify what you, what, what you mean by, by what, spending cap? Well, obviously the welfare spending cap that your government has put in place. Has there been any analysis done uh, on the impacts of that on child poverty? Today, the, the UK government is going to an, uh, announce it's a uh, child poverty a strategy. It may already uh, have done so. Obviously, that dovetails in uh, with the uh, uh, Scottish uh, Parliament or Scottish Government a uh, strategy, which the Deputy First Minister uh, uh, announced. Obviously, uh, you wouldn't expect that I agree with, with, with a number of the comments that she made uh, around uh, that. Um, what, um, respectfully, convener, I, I, I think might be a useful thing to do is for the committee to have a to look at that UK strategy in relation to a, uh, Scotland and for uh, and, and I would undertake that one of my ministerial colleagues will come uh, to discuss that strategy uh, with with yourselves but that that is being rolled out today I don't think uh, it, it, it would necessarily be you know, helpful to... I mean, I, I can read it out or read out the headline parts of it or all the rest of it. I don't think that would necessarily be uh, helpful, but I think what would be helpful is for the committee to look at the UK government's uh, strategy in relation uh, uh, to child poverty and, and, and to uh, constructively ana analyse it in the context as well of the Scottish government uh, uh, child poverty. Can, convener, that wasn't really the question I asked. I asked um, if uh, these caps uh, were informed by research, if there was any analysis by government, any estimate by government. A, a simple yes or no would probably suffice here. The, was the, there any analysis the, done before you decided the cap, to implement the this cap, policy? The cap is informed by affordability, affordability it, of our of, uh, of welfare. By affordability. Yes. And in which case, can I, can I move on on that particular point? Because um, 
this cap and other welfare reforms, CPAG um, have estimated that child poverty in Scotland can, could increase by up to 100,000 by 2020. Save the Children have now estimated that as a result of the welfare cap, this could be even higher, and by 2020 that one in three children could be living in poverty. They have also said that the commitment of Westminster parties to eradicate child poverty by 2020 are no longer credible. Are these policies not credible, Minister? I don't agree with those, uh, uh, those statements that you've uh, uh, set out. The UK government is publishing today a, a child poverty a strategy a, uh, in respect of its responsibilities. Obviously, the Scottish Government have a number uh, of uh, responsibilities uh, in uh, that regard. And I think that that's, that's how uh, uh, you should assess uh, what the figures are going to be in relation uh, to child poverty in 2020. We are looking uh, uh, to get to a position uh, of, of zero uh, child poverty in 2020. We want to work uh, with uh, the Scottish Government to achieve that. I, I think the, the Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament, uh, all of us should be very proud of the fact that in uh, relative and real terms, child poverty uh, is, is at its lowest uh, level since the mid-1990s. Uh, I, th I think that, that, that that's something that should be a... Uh, we, sh we should be positive about it. But, of course, a, uh, we can do more. We've set out in our strategy being uh, launched uh, today how we, how we think within the UK government responsibilities we could do more. But I'm absolutely clear it is one area in which the Scottish government and UK government have to work more closely together and in which uh, you know, we, we, we don't get bogged down uh, in, in politicking. It's too important for that. Um, it seems that there has been no analysis done by the UK government in terms of the, the, the responses from the Minister, um, and it seems that um, the analysis that's been carried out by CPAG and Save the Children is being uh, disregarded uh, by the Minister here today as well. Can I ask, in terms of the further uh, welfare cuts, the, the cuts to the Social Security bu budget envisaged by George Osborne, which may be as high as £12 billion. Will you analyse what those further cuts will do uh, in terms of, of child poverty uh, here in Scotland? I, I, I repeat, because I, 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 I'm not, I, certainly not dismissing what a, uh, other organisations are saying, but, but I think you're not, you're not listening with respect, Mr Stewart, to what I'm saying. I'm saying that the UK Government has set out its strategy uh, for a uh, reduction, further reductions in child poverty, and actually, at the core of our philosophy, is it is not about the payment of benefit. We don't believe that the payment of benefits is the best way out of poverty. We believe that work and and ensuring that children are part of a working family is the best way out of poverty. That's what our uh, that's what our approach is uh, aimed at uh, uh, achieving. So therefore, it's not about how much do we need to spend uh, on welfare uh, to reduce child poverty. It's what do we need to do to make sure that there are as many children as possible in Scotland in a working a household. Of course there will be some households where people will never be able to work and that's why the other part of our uh, approach is to target resources uh, onto the most uh, vulnerable. Now I understand you're coming from a different perspective but I do ask you when it's published today to read our UK uh, child poverty strategy and I undertake that I or a ministerial colleague will come back and a, uh, you know, submit to your scrutiny of, a, uh, of that strategy, because our approach in terms of, of taking that issue forward is clearly, clearly different from your own. Um, I think we all agree that uh, it is best if folk do get back to work, but your austerity measures are not helping in terms of job creation. Um, in terms of that further £12 billion of cuts to welfare as proposed, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Can I ask how involved are you and the Secretary of State in the discussions about where the axe falls in terms of that £12 billion? 
The Secretary, as I, as I said in, in relation to Linda Fabiani's uh, question, the Secretary of State uh, and I are uh, actively involved in relation to uh, welfare issues and uh, policies in relation to Scotland. And I think, uh, I, 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 think I, I demonstrated that uh, in my uh, previous uh, answer. The UK government, the, the, the Conservative part of the UK government is committed to further a uh, welfare uh, reform and people in Scotland, should there be a no vote in the referendum, will have the opportunity uh, at next year's UK general election to express their views in that regard. Thank you, Commissioner. Look forward to that. Um, we go to Annabelle to be followed by Ken. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, uh, Minister. You mentioned a minute ago that uh, you felt that children should be part of a working family, and I don't think anybody would disagree with that as an objective. But obviously, uh, the, the, the overriding objective, presumably, would be that children are part of a family that actually has the means to put food on the table. Of course, of course I do. And the, the, the suggestion a, um, that, that somehow anybody would be a, you know, happy with the, the number uh, of, of people uh, using food, food banks a, uh, is a, uh, a, you know, not, you know, not correct. I, I think it's, it's very, very important, as I've said in previous answers, that we get to uh, more data as to understand why that's a, the case. But people have... That there is a situation inevitably, a, and I'm sure this might even happen in an independent Scotland where people are in crisis and do need a, immediate help and support. And I think we should commend a, uh, those a, uh, charitable bodies and others a, uh, who uh, seek to support them in th those moments of crisis. But I, I don't want to see people going to uh, food banks. Well, of course, in an independent Scotland, we will not not preside over the dismantling of the welfare system and the safety net that provides. Um, but looking at the really, truly appalling statistic, and I do mention it again, because of all the alarming things this committee has looked at and all the alarming developments we have looked at, truly the most shocking has to be the fact that in the last year, 22,387 children, young lives, had to rely on food banks in order to eat. And I just wonder, does that appalling statistic ever cause the minister to lose any sleep at all at night uh, further to the impact of his government's policies? My approach in these matters is that I want to help and support people. I don't see a uh, vulnerable people as being a, an opportunity to politic or make a, a political point. Uh, scoring. Nobody wants to see children uh, in, in families uh, attending uh, food banks, but we do need to understand uh, why uh, that's happening, get some more uh, detailed statistics that everybody can subscribe to and uh, rely on. I mean, I, I could give you the statistic, for example, that 65% uh, of, of people who have attended Trussell Trust a, uh, a food bank have only done so uh, on, on one occasion, which rather you know, dim d diminishes the, the sometimes uh, approach which suggests that people uh, are, are, are relying on a weekly basis uh, for, for a food bank. Maybe some people are, but not the vast majority of people who attend uh, the Trussell Trust uh, food banks. Let's get an approach to this uh, issue uh, of, uh, of attendance at food banks that is, is about resolving, it, uh, about resolving uh, the issues, about understanding uh, the crisis people are facing and, and the specific reasons why uh, they're there so that, that, so that we can uh, move forward. And I, I think the best approach uh, for that to be achieved is for us actually to be working uh, together, not uh, placing this issue uh, at the centre of every political uh, uh, discussion. This issue is, uh, has to be at the centre because it is truly appalling and the idea that because a child attends a food bank only once that somehow that is acceptable. That is not acceptable, Minister. Right. Not in the kind of country that I want to live in. That is simply not acceptable. But moving, I didn't say, I didn't moving say, on I didn't, because I, didn't, I, didn't say I don't that. think we're did, going to make I? any headway. You don't lose any sleep over it. I didn't. Over that. Well, can I turn I to didn't, the, can no, I turn to the Ewing, issue? Ewing, Ewing, I'm not going to be misrepresented. You, I didn't say that. But that was I a logical follow-on no, from no, what you said. Only 
by your own Mr. logic. Mr. talking over one another, so please. If I could move on, convener, just to the Thank issue. You. I know that time is short. I've got one issue to raise uh, briefly, which is the issue of the way that um, people with long-term conditions, including mental health problems, uh, are dealt with under the benefits system and the work capability assessment in particular, but not exclusively. Uh, and I wonder, does the minister feel comfortable about the way that such people are dealt with under the, the benefits system? I certainly think that we do have to continue to improve uh, the way in which uh, we support people with, with mental health. I think that, that there's, there's widespread uh, agreement. That's an issue uh, which is uh, regularly raised within a, uh, a, the Westminster Parliament by, by a, uh, Scottish uh, MPs. It's uh, been part of the uh, approach in relation to a, uh, trying to take forward a, um, a, the uh, working capability uh, assessments. The key uh, to those assessments remains the fact that we have to, uh, uh, we have to get uh, all the information uh, available uh, uh, at one time to ensure that, that, that an assessment uh, uh, can be a, uh, can be made. Uh, so I, I, I absolutely take on board uh, that not just in relation, not just in relation to benefit issues, but in relation to virtually every aspect of the way in which government functions in our society, we've got to do better for people with mental health. Can I just read out then, Minister, because uh, it was a question that one of our witnesses who came to bravely to give evidence to our committee a while back, and they were asked what they would like to ask uh, the, uh, the UK Secretary of State He's refused to come to our committee. We have you today. So I would like to put to you uh, a comment that Leslie McMurchie made about her husband, who had a number of mental health and physical problems, but was found fit to work. And she said, uh, inter alia, I am a history graduate, and I thought that when we set up the welfare state, it was to be there for people such as my husband, who worked hard and did his best, so that in times of need, something would be there for him. But it is not there. That would be my question for Ian Duncan Smith. There should be something there for those hard-working men and women who have contributed so to society. They are being left with nothing. What would you say in response to that, Minister? I'd be very ha happy, obviously, to look into Mr March's particular a, uh, case. Uh, as, an, as a constituency uh, MP, I deal with a large number of uh, constituents who have a, uh, you know, encountered issues in relation to uh, assessments. I look to support them and, and uh, assist them through the process. So we're very much a, uh, a, uh, and very happy to look at, at those uh, specific uh, circumstances because if we have uh, a system that's not delivering uh, that, uh, uh, that, that is most certainly not uh, our aspiration. Uh, well, there are no words, but thank you, convener. Well, Ken, finally. Uh, Convener, thank you, Minister, for coming along. Um, just to return to the issue of food banks, you'd like to hear. Um, can I just ask, you, you, you said you're concerned about the rise of food banks. Are you concerned that they might become institutionalised in our country? There's certainly, uh, I make it absolutely clear, no intention that they should become a, uh, institutionalised. We, we, we have, a, and, and I think we should applaud people a, who, a, on a voluntary basis, help people who are uh, in crisis. And that, that's a long-standing um, thing in, in, in Scotland. There are a lot of food, food banks which have actually emerged you know, from existing arrangements, perhaps operated by churches or other a, voluntary a, uh, groups. A, um, I think, as I've said in, in previous in, in other in, uh, answers, we do need to have a much greater understanding about what's going on uh, in relation to uh, the, the, the use of food banks, uh, but I wouldn't uh, want to see them become part of the, uh, uh, of the welfare state. I'm glad to hear that. Um, one of the pieces of evidence we heard was, very disturbing evidence we heard, was from Mr Neil Cooling, who's a, um, the Work Services Director at the DWP, and he said that uh, the rise in food banks was due to supply-led growth, and he said it was because of poor people maximising their economic choices. Do you agree with that analysis? One thing which is clear is that because the government has uh, chosen to 
make the uh, availability of food banks more uh, uh, known in, in job centres and through other uh, channels, th then more people are aware. Uh, clearly, there's, there's more a uh, local a, um, a media on a food banks in, in localities. So I think, I mean, I, I think it, it is to be accepted that there is a greater awareness a, uh, of a, uh, a, the, the availability of food banks. I, I think we just have to get to a, um, the, we have to get to a point where we have a agreed a research and evidence, which isn't going to be the subject uh, of, of, of politic and rowing, that we understand why, uh, why, why there is this degree of, of, of use of, of, of food banks. And I think it's, that's at the point uh, you know, that we can uh, make a, 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 a practical response to the issue. Well, well, I, think, I think most of the members of the committee would agree with that. Uh, but we did take a lot of evidence. And what was interesting, I mean, you said earlier that the committee wasn't unanimous, but Mr Johnson aside, who is the one Conservative member of the committee, the committee was unanimous. And the witnesses, I mean, this, is the, this was the, the, the interesting fact that the witnesses were overwhelmingly clear in their evidence. So we're talking about you know, Oxfam, uh, Salvation Army, Citizens of West Scotland and so on. Overwhelmingly clear that there is a link. Now, it's not a simplistic link, but there is a link between the welfare reforms and the rise in food banks. Do, do you not accept that there is a link? What I'll uh, do in light of your comments and some of the other comments is I, I'm quite happy to meet myself with uh, uh, the witnesses and uh, uh, hear a, uh, and, and have an exchange a, uh, uh, with them. I, I mean, I, I, I don't dismiss what these... Uh, organisations say what I what I do uh, uh, what what I don't agree it, as you you allude to is it, it, it's a, a simplistic a uh, um, a simplistic analysis which says you know welfare reform equals food banks I don't accept that. Yes, sir. The committee didn't say that either. I mean, the committee suggested it was a complex link. Um, the committee also heard evidence from Dr. Philip Sasenko, in which he pointed out that if you look at the rise in the growth of food banks. Uh, there's an elbow, you know, in the in the rise, and that elbow coincides with the increase, the tougher sanctions regimes uh, introduced in October 12, followed by the uh, welfare reforms of April 13, of uh, um, uh, reforms to disability allowance, of uh, limiting the rise in uh, benefits to one percent rather than inflation. So he's he's making a very clear statistical link. What would you make of evidence such as that? This is not. Uh, anecdotal evidence. This is firm statistical evidence. The DWP doesn't uh, accept that a uh, statistical a uh, link, but it come. We, I do go back to the point that I think it is. It, it is a, you know, it, it is important that we have a uh, we, we have more evidence in relation to. Uh, this this situation and uh, I mean and uh, as your report alluded to, it's not just in Scotland uh, uh, that, that that it's happening. Uh, I, 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 we need, you know we need to have we need to have a better um, a, a understanding in that regard on on sanctions, which we haven't maybe covered as much as I thought we might might have been covered given your report. I mean, I, I think we could uh, also uh, convene, it would be helpful, um, send you a, a, firstly, as alluded to my earlier remarks, as the Oakley uh, report. But I, I mean, we can respond to some of the points that were, that, that were in, in, in the report, if that's helpful. I just clarify, though, the point I was trying to make is that we have collected a lot of evidence, mm -hmm. uh, and the evidence is quite clear. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not that we are bl blinded by our own political prejudice. Mm -hmm. This is evidence that's been presented to the Scottish Parliament, both anecdotal and statistical, solidly uh, based uh, scientific research, empirical evidence that makes this link. Can I ask, you're suggesting you need to look for further data. Are you currently producing a report? Are you looking for further data to establish the reasons behind the rise in food banks? We're considering how that can be best uh, achieved. In you the just think how it might be done. no, well, I, I, th I think it's it's important uh, for the for the reasons that we've discussed that if so, that if, that if, that if work a uh, is a uh, done, then it's done in a way that 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 that, that commands wide 
uh, spread a uh, support, and that it, it you know it isn't the subject of a that, that isn't the subject of of of, of politicking a, uh, a to and fro because I you know I I read quite a lot of uh, cut and paste press releases which just you know say the same you know the same thing in relation to welfare uh, reform you know I, I want an analysis of the use of food banks that everybody can subscribe to as to what the range of complex reasons, as you, as you accept, uh, for the rise in the, in, in the use of food banks so that we can, we, we can a, uh, take, it, a, uh, take, it, take forward uh, a, the situation. Could, could I just clarify then, because... I, so it is. I'm, so I'm, make it very, very brief. The, the official DW position is not there for, as Mr Cooling described, because he was suggesting that it's because of supply-led growth. What you're suggesting is that's not quite true. That's just part of the picture, and there is a further, there's a bigger picture. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Cooling gave his uh, evidence. I, I, you know, I've, I've set out a, uh, my. Is, is it the DWP's position that this is because of supply-led growth? The DWP position, as is my position, is that this is a complex uh, issue. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to all the, the committee members for sticking as best we could to time. We're just slightly over, uh, Minister, and thank you very much for your evidence. Uh, just for information, um, our report on sanctions uh, has been sent to Esther McVeigh, Minister, and we're awaiting a response to the points that we raised uh, in, in that report. And our own report on food banks has been sent to uh, Ian Duncan Smith, and again, we await um, a response from him to our report. Uh, we have invited both of them to come and speak to us about our reports, but they keep running away from us. So the next time you meet them, maybe you could tell them that we're here and we're welcome, uh, we would welcome their attendance. Um, I will I'll, I'll close by saying I would uh, say that I would look forward to, to having you back, possibly in, in, in a year's time when things move on. But in a year's time, I hope we've got a Labour government and it won't be yourself, Minister, <laughs> who's sitting at that end of the well, table. But, well, uh, the, the one matter we agree on, you and I agree on, Convener, is that those, those are issues, you know, the policy issues are a matter to be, you know, debated in, a, in an election. Okay. But thanks very much, this morning, Minister, for your time. I appreciate you coming before us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What? I need to close the meeting now. Thank you.